The Overdue Review! Welcome, Randys, to the end of Pokemon. Sorry for the massive delay, but we had troubles recording our footage and eventually had to turn to the dreaded emulator. I still bought both games and planned on initially recording using the features of Pokemon Stadium, but it didn't work out. On top of that issue, I only have two words for you guys. In caves. I've never actually fully played through the original red and blue versions, and I was shocked at some of the stuff I was not expecting. But we'll get to that stuff soon enough. So did I like this Crimson Blast from the past? Well, let's take a look. This is my review of Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow version. The Game I should preface this review by stating that this was not my first generation of Pokemon games. In terms of exposure to the franchise as a whole, I will always be a diehard Gen 1-er due to the cards, anime, and supplemental games like Stadium. But in terms of a core Pokemon video game experience, my heart will always belong to Silver version. That's just the kind of fan that I am. And speaking of core experiences, let's take a look at the one that set the standard for many generations to come, Pokemon Red. And yes, I know Yellow sort of the definitive version, but I wanted to be faithful to the main campaign and not Ashes. We begin our journey as Red, a 10-year-old boy from Pallet Town who sets off on his quest to become a Pokémon Master. After attempting to blindly go into the wild, Red is stopped by Professor Oak, who provides him with a mission and a best friend. Along with a Pokédex that records data on every known species of pocket monster, the Professor offers our protagonist a starter Pokémon to protect him from wild creatures in the scary tall grass. It's at this time that you also meet the Professor's grandson and your lifelong rival McLoathes, I mean Blue, who absolutely oozes 90 slime and will prove a major pain in your butt for the rest of your journey. I'm not kidding, this guy is such a jerk that he purposely chooses the starter that has a type advantage over your chosen partner, regardless of who that may be. Want to choose Bulbasaur? Look forward to Fire Blast. What about Squirtle? Say hello to Solar Beam. But whether it was designed this way or not, canonically speaking, Red sets out on his adventure with the fire-type Charmander by his side, while Blue chooses Squirtle. And with that, Red's adventure officially begins. After winning a quick battle versus Blue, Red and Charmander set out for Viridian City, where the gym is mysteriously closed and the Pokemarts are open. It's here that you can purchase Pokeballs, which provide the game's major focus, capturing Pokemon so you can fill that dex. You see, Pokemon follows a very RPG-like structure, but with the possibility of 151 party members fulfilled by your team of six chosen Pokemon. There's also things like type advantages, weaknesses, potions, and items that offer elements of strategy and a leveling system from 1 to 100 that will keep you busy training to ensure that no one playthrough is the same. And speaking of catching Pokemon, as you make your way to the left of Viridian City, it becomes very clear that your rival has done just that. After another fairly simple battle with Blue, it's revealed that just west of Viridian lies the Indigo Plateau, a place where aspiring trainers battle the Elite Four to become the League Champion. Blue then reveals that to even gain access to this legendary Colosseum, trainers are required to collect 8 badges from all over the Kanto region, and of course he pledges to achieve this goal before you. It's then that our true objective is clear. Red must travel from town to town collecting these badges, and beat his rival Blue to become the true Pokemon League Champion. Soon after learning this and beating Blue, Red makes his way through Pewter City and Brock's Rock-type Gym, where he gains his first badge and sets out for Mount Moon. And this is where we meet the villainous Team Rocket. This criminal organization is after rare Pokemon, and don't take losing to a 10-year-old very lightly. After a swift beating, they swear their revenge, and Red makes his way towards Cerulean City. Here, he meets the second gym leader, Misty, who uses an array of Water-type Pokemon. Once defeated, Red heads south with the Cascade Badge in tow, where he battles Lieutenant Surge, a Thunder-type gym leader who mentions a war that will never be spoken of again. During the interim, he also picks up a bike as well as his first HM, which is a teachable move that can and will be used outside of battle. And this is where it can get kinda confusing. Because the guards are thirsty. Yeah, seriously. Delish. And due to this unspeakable travesty, they won't let our hero pass easily into Saffron City and so you'll need to find alternative routes around the region. Eventually though, after passing through Rock Tunnel, which by the way is a massive pain in the butt, and the ominous Lavender Town, Red finds himself in Celadon City, 
This area has lots to offer, but something's not quite right. Eventually, Red discovers Team Rocket's secret base behind the gambling house and comes face to face with the organization's leader, Giovanni, who's not very happy to see you at all. Once bested in a battle of his own, Giovanni chastises Red and promises not to lose again as Red obtains the Sylph Scope. Our protagonist then quickly finds himself up against Celadon's grass-type gym leader, Erica, and after obtaining his fourth badge, heads back to Lavender Town with the newly acquired Sylph Scope to hunt some ghosts. Anyways, once back in Lavender Town, Red defeats his rival yet again, puts Cubone's dead mother's spirit to rest, and beats more rocket grunts in order to reach Mr. Fuji and obtain the Poke Flute, which will allow him to proceed on his journey. But, of course, this is after buying some sweet, sweet water from the vending machines in Celadon and gaining access to Saffron City at last. Mm, baby. But, before he can challenge the psychic gym leader Sabrina, he must pay yet another visit to Team Rocket, as they've currently taken Silphco hostage in an extortion attempt to gain access to the company's revolutionary prototype, the Master Ball. This special invention will allow any Pokémon to be caught with 100% accuracy, and with his team of Pokémon beside him, Red comes face to face with both his rival and Giovanni once again. Although, oddly enough, it's never really explained why your rival is there to begin with. In fact, this is one of the most out-of-nowhere fights in the entire game. But regardless, once you beat them both, Team Rocket collapses and Red is awarded a Master Ball of his very own. And it's at this point that the game becomes somewhat of a breeze, as you beat Sabrina's insanely broken Psychic-type Pokémon, cycle to Fuchsia City where you go on Safari and wreck Koga's Poison-type gym, and then surf your way to Cinnabar Island and the Pokémon Mansion all in probably under an hour. It's also worth mentioning that next to Lavender Town, this mansion is the most unnerving place in the game, as you desperately need to find the secret key to access Blaine's Fire-type gym, all while getting the sense that there's something far more sinister at work in the background. Eventually, you find the key, embarrass Blaine's fire duck, and make your way back to Viridian City, where the once absent gym leader is awaiting your arrival. And after facing a few trainers, it's revealed that the entire time Viridian's gym leader was none other than... Giovanni, and he's still quite sour over what transpired back at Silphco. After a hard-fought match, Giovanni finally admits defeat and awards Red his 8th and final badge, paving the way for Red's Elite Four Challenge. And once making his way through Victory Road, Red comes face to face with the ridiculously strong Elite Four. This group consists of Lorelai, an Ice-type user, Bruno, a fighting style trainer, Agatha, the queen of ghost Pokémon, and possibly Oak's former lover, and finally the strongest of them all, Lance, a Dragon-type master. If you've done your job correctly, Red will finally overcome Lance and realize his ultimate dream of being blindsided by Blue for one final glorious battle. And I'm not kidding, at every single previous encounter, this guy's been pretty much even in terms of levels, but if you haven't trained or grinded a little bit, then this is one tough battle, especially after the other four have taken a toll on your entire party. You're gonna have to fight your hardest, but once the last attack is made and his sixth Pokemon drops, you finally accomplished your ultimate goal. You are the Pokemon League Champion. And that's pretty much it, although once you've let the credits roll, you can continue your game and tie up a few loose ends. But let's just wait a little longer to get into that. The Pros! Pokemon Red, the version I played, has a lot going on, and it gets a lot of things right. The interchangeability of party members is astounding for the time, especially considering this was a mobile game made with a very small budget by Nintendo standards. I think it really works because of this reason. It's a universal experience that every person can enjoy at their own leisure, but most importantly with their own customized team of Pokémon. If you love water types, you can recruit the ultimate water party. If you want a diverse lineup of creatures ready to one-hit kill any foe, then you can do that too. The feature of over 150 diverse Pokémon was a very ambitious undertaking, and one that effectively made this game what it is today. The creatures themselves also add a lot of personality into the mix. Some really stand out, even amongst the, shall we say, less than appealing first-gen sprites. And Ken Sugimori's artwork was a shining example of Game Freak's genius, even way back then. Special mention for character design goes towards creatures like Raichu, Onyx, Blastoise, Lapras, and a few others. On top of this, the way in which they progressively evolve into stronger creatures 
may be one of the coolest parts of this game. Although not wholly original, usually when an RPG character moves onto another stage, like in Fire Emblem, you merely get a new clothing style or character class. But in Pokemon, this concept is expanded on and perfected. Creatures can evolve into completely new and stronger versions of their evolutionary line by either leveling up, trading, or via elemental stone. These various methods of evolution add even more player choice into the fold, and really help make the journey your Pokemon goes through feel even more personal than I've already established. It's just a wonderful mechanic in a game that gives players every possible option to experience their own personalized quest. But enough about that, let's get into the other thing that made these games so original back in the day, the trading. Pokemon was conceived by creator Satoshi Tajiri's childhood fascination with collecting and trading insects in rural Japan, and this game applies those fundamentals brilliantly. By creating two main versions of the game, each with their own version-specific Pokemon, players had no choice but to venture into the schoolyard with a link cable if they really wanted to catch them all. It took Tajiri's memories of bug catching with schoolmates and modernized them for the digital age, which is yet another move that is still injected into Pokemon's DNA with every subsequent generation, no matter how much easier trading has become. The fact is, Game Freak designed these video games to be social, and the move has continuously paid off for the once tiny company. And the thing that might be that once tiny company's biggest contribution to the video game world is the uncontested soundtrack. I know I often go on about how good these things are in every game I review, but I really need to give this score major points for how spectacular it is. Let's put it this way, I've played every single generation of Pokemon since this one, and I've heard so many remixes and orchestrated variations of this game's soundtrack since its release that you would think I'd be annoyed beyond belief. And yet, there's something about this retro sounding composition that had me nodding my head to the beat with every new place I visited. The music is atmospheric to put it lightly, and each theme fits its locale flawlessly with very few pieces missing their mark. In fact, this game either has songs that no one remembers, or modern classics that have persisted over the last two decades of video game culture. There's no in-between, and there's no okay or good songs. The music is either unmemorable or gaming royalty, and crazy enough, it's the latter that makes up 90% of this soundtrack. I really can't rave enough about this, but it's not even my favorite part. That honor belongs to the deep lore of the games. You know, the mystery of exploration and being rewarded for your troubles. In a way, this game reminded me a ton of the original Legend of Zelda after a full playthrough, as there are a ton of secrets and puzzles that just add to this game's more mature and cerebral mystique. Now I know, this is a kid's game, and I won't be the guy who spews theories on Gary's Raticate or Giovanni's suicide, but the fact is, there's a lot of mature concepts hidden beneath the childlike exterior, and it's very much appreciated. I find it unbelievably cool that there's elements such as death and war and themes of playing God buried within the narrative. It's especially that last one that really stuck out to me as both inappropriate, but also unspeakably satisfying. You see, this whole generation of Pokemon is very much grounded in our reality and raises questions of DNA tampering and genetic engineering all over the place. From characters like Voltorb and Grimer to number 150, we get a sense that this is a world where there's a lot less magic going on and a lot more science involved than subsequent generations. And nothing supports this more than the creation of Mewtwo. You know, it's such a small part of the story, but it has so many implications on this world as a whole. Essentially, if you read all of the journals in the burned down Pokemon Mansion, you can piece together that a bunch of scientists, likely including Blaine and Mr. Fuji, discovered a long extinct Pokemon named Mew in Guyana, and using its DNA mutilated and tortured various clones in order to create an artificial super weapon they dubbed Mew 2. And I'm not exaggerating here, the game's translations use terminology like vicious tendencies. This is a story of science trying to play God with disastrous results, and it's alluded that many were murdered and now it's being covered up as the ultimate secret in the Pokemon world. It's very deep stuff, and honestly makes the narrative not only tighter, but also more impactful, especially when you finally encounter the level 70 Mewtwo locked away deep in Cerulean Cave. With a simple but tragic backstory, you actually feel sympathy for this abomination, and appreciate why it lives on its own sheltered deep within a cave. It also raises the question of Mew, which would actually turn out to be a real Pokemon buried within the game's code, which 
would make this already secretive world of Pokemon even more mysterious. So yeah, overall I loved a ton of the concepts in this game, and actually found myself surprised by more than a few. But did I have any problems? Let's just get into the cons and find out. The cons! Okay, I've tried my best to hold it back this long, and I really do love a ton about this game. The hidden maturity of the narrative, various customizability mechanics, and of course that music. But honestly, next to the stuff I mentioned in the previous section, this game is not only archaic, but it's actually borderline broken. I'm not talking about the glitches or the fact that I was legally able to exploit the game's coding and obtain a Mew by the second gym, and yes, I emulated, but I didn't cheat. I actually tried this on a friend's yellow version, and it works 100%. No, I'm talking about everything from the massively powerful Psychic-type Pokémon, to the special stat not being split among attack and defense, to things like Pokéballs missing. I seriously didn't even know this was a thing, and I'm really interested to see if it carries over to the second gen, and I simply forgot. But yeah, there's some Pokemon that even an Ultra Ball will just miss if it's not paralyzed, asleep, or frozen. That essentially means that if I wasn't lucky enough to have caught a Jigglypuff like I did before Cerulean, and raise it to a competitive level, I would have been screwed going after the Legendary Birds, even with a ton of revives and Ultra Balls during my own playthrough. I mean, I get that the chances of catching these guys aren't supposed to be great, but if I can get Articuno down to this much damage, I shouldn't miss the thing entirely. Besides that, I also really have to criticize some of these designs. Now, I know I praised a few of them, and there really are some great additions, but I'm with Fawful's minion on this one. How can you make fun of Generation 5's Ice Cream Cone and Garbage Pokémon when we have such uncreative inclusions? Think I'm absolutely nuts? Well, let's do a roll call. Pidgey is a Pigeon. Caterpie is a Caterpillar. Rattata is a Rat. Kakuna is a Cocoon. Spearow is a Sparrow. Krabby is a Crab. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not done. Ponyta's a pony, Seal is a seal, Horsey is a seahorse, we have two caterpillars, two butterflies, four mice, a reverse pokeball, a fetish for gluing three pokemon together, and whatever Jinx and Executor even are. Seriously, who cares about ice cream when there's literally a group of six eggs with faces that turn into this thing? <sighs> My point is, no generation of pokemon is perfect, but this one barely even put up a fight, and I honestly think the variety in this game is what makes it even that much worse. I fought so many of the same Pokémon. I get that my team of Pokémon needs experience to gain levels, but why make me fight the exact same Machop, Kadabra, Coughing, and Ghastly lineup for the entire game? That's just not fun. I mean, I know I'm exaggerating a bit, but the recurring Pokémon thing gets old really quickly, and it's quite possibly the worst kind of padding in a video game. Besides that issue, the other is the crime organization. I know that Team Flare gets a bad rap for being unmemorable, and honestly, they are. But Team Rocket really isn't any better. Unless you're playing Yellow Version, there's no member beyond Giovanni that really stands out, and even with him, I'm not even that sure of his motives. Now with the Blink and You Miss It backstory involving Mewtwo, it's quite possible that he's seeking a Master Ball to capture Mewtwo and take over the world, and that would actually be a pretty okay plot. But at this point it's only speculation, and as such all I can take away is that Team Rocket's evil just cuz, and they want that one Master Ball cuz plot stuff. I don't know. Like I said, I like Giovanni, and his extra appearance as the final gym leader adds a bit more to his characterization, at least for me. But Team Rocket just sort of blows, and I never look forward to taking them on because it just feels like a chore. And that's sort of my attitude towards this game in general. It's 2015, and I have five other brilliant generations to choose from, including one with remakes of this very game. And because of that, this game feels kind of chore-like. On top of that, it features maybe the worst momentum swings of any main series game. The first three gyms can be beaten in under three hours. Fairly simple stuff. But then once you beat Surge, it's a long ride from the fourth to the fifth badge, and then you beat Sabrina and everything flies by again. But absolutely, without a doubt, my two least favorite things in this game are the caves and the item storage. And I know what you're thinking, just use repels in the PC and you'll be fine. But no you won't be. Repels never work, not 100% at least. Here's a clip sped up of me and Cerulean Cave trying to capture Mewtwo using max repels the entire time. They're not doing anything. Maybe I'm underleveled. Maybe that's just how this game goes, but you know what? It's annoying. Why did I even buy the item if it doesn't work? 
And as for the PC, well, that's a great way to store a ton of your items, but eventually you'll hit a point where you need to keep ones like the bike, HMs, and Pokeballs, but you'll find yourself in a situation like Silphco or Victory Road where there are items everywhere and you have no room. Or even worse, something like the Safari Zone where you need two key items, but you don't know where they are. So like any normal person, you'll just pick up whatever you find, hoping it's Surf or the Gold Teeth, and eventually your bag will get full. And that's my problem here. I was essentially forced to use TMs or potions when I didn't want to, but if I didn't want to sacrifice an item to make room, I'd be in for a ton of backtracking, therefore stopping the game's momentum cold. I get that there are technical limitations, and I get that this game is a marvel that it even allows as many items as it does, but personally, I would have been fine with 100 Pokemon and fighting a thousand Ghastlies if it meant I can just pick up any item and not worry that my bag's getting full. Alright. Rant over. I'm sorry Gen 1ers if I hurt your feelings, but that's just simply what I discovered playing this 20 year old game for the first time in full. And even if at times it's broken, I still don't think it's a bad game. Also, it's worth noting that Yellow Version did feature some cool anime inspired choices that help alleviate some of these problems, but even a traveling Pikachu companion couldn't overcome my negative impressions. Final Verdict Well, I must seem crazy. I just praised this game like it was my only child and then immediately crucified it like it was my Melee vs Brawl video. And I guess that really is a testament to how revolutionary this series was. It wrote the book on Pokemon, and whether I think it's broken or not doesn't change the fact that there are some really astounding moments. Every time I saw a face I remembered, or captured a legendary Pokemon, a childlike smile emerged on my face, even if I just finished raging over an Ultra Ball missing entirely. I guess that's just the beauty of games like Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow. With a few small moments, they can transport me to a different time in my life. A time when anything seemed possible, and I had to change batteries every month. And although there are a few very noticeable flaws, I can't completely dismiss this one because I was surprised at the amount of fun I had playing such an archaic game. At the same time though, I honestly do believe if you really want this specific Pokemon experience, then you're just best to play through Fire Red and Leaf Green as they bolster the things that made this game an instant masterpiece and do away with most of the gripes I had. So in summation, Gen 1 should only be played for those who want to gain a sense of nostalgia or who never got to experience the inception of Pokemon during its initial boom of popularity. Otherwise, steer clear of this one. Pokemon Generation 1 gets a 6 out of 10. It's so dated and almost unplayable by today's standards, but every once in a while, you get a moment like this. With... Uh, what? What? We, we might be able to do... With Slash and Burn, we could do this. We could... We can do this. This is gonna happen. Oh my god, this is gonna happen. This is gonna happen. This is gonna happen. This is gonna happen. Ah! Yes! Yes! Oh, you're so stupid, but yes! Ah! No, I would, that would have sucked. Seriously, having to redo all of that? Oh my god, that was... Mm, how poetic is that? Charizard, we, I had Charizard left, and he had Blastoise left, and Charizard overcame it with 44 left? 15 levels under, are you kidding me? Man. Once again, I'm very sorry for dragging Pokemon into August, and I appreciate every single like, favorite, share, and response that these videos have gotten. July was our best month as a channel ever, and that would have been impossible without the help of all of you baby rhinos. But if I'm being honest for a second, I'm really exhausted. Stan, you doing okay, man? Honestly, Roy, this month took a huge toll on my personal life. Don't get me wrong, I loved every minute of it, but saying it was stressful is a bit of an understatement. I hear you. Fire Month has set me back way more than I planned. Yeah, I know. It's just, I missed a few deadlines and I let a few Amiibo fans down. I know, dude, but remember, you're only one guy. Neon and Connor could only help out so much. Yeah, they really did help, though. In fact, it was Neon's idea to even do the Poke Amiibo video in the first place. I think maybe you deserve a break. Just enjoy the last bit of summer, and then come back more refreshed and better than ever. I mean, Pokemon did amazing. Thanks, Roy. You know, maybe you're right. Good luck in the lens portal. Just take it easy. I'm out. Delicious. Well, guys, you've got to know that I love you and I love this channel more than anything. But I'm going to be taking a small break from YouTube to recharge my zoo batteries. 
this isn't the end, and we'll be back with a brand new video by the end of the month, but I just need some time to mend some relationships and restructure the channel a bit. For the last two years, I've single-handedly edited every video from scratch from this tiny laptop, and with the help of you guys, we've finally been able to upgrade to a full PC. So I sincerely need to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. This isn't the end of the story, just the first book, and like the Pokemon series, we're here to prove that sometimes the second entry is even better than the first. I can't wait to see all of you at the end of August, and once again have to sincerely thank every single person who helped out with the month. I want you to let us know what your favorite video was in the comment section below, and like I always say guys, happy hunting baby rhinos.